good talking to you. There's plenty of things you could do better with your life than box. Prove it. I'll train you. If you don't sweat for me, you're out of my life. I'm training to be a boxer. You mean like power hour? You are crazy. There is this one guy. 100% man, if you know what I mean. And how would you do it with this percentage? It's a dangerous sport. Aren't you afraid of getting hurt? I didn't make the cheerleading team. Girl Fight, it's a movie, it's a sports movie that doesn't care about sports. It features a female lead that is hard-nosed, bordering on unlikable, and it deals with subjects that still make producers nowadays uncomfortable. You know, gender equality, double standards between the sexes, um, male emotional fra uh, fragility, the quiet desperation of living in the projects, you know, it's all stuff that makes people uncomfortable. And I think her handling of the topics, especially for a first time filmmaker in the year 2000, are enough to make a similar modern filmmaker's head explode. Because her hand is so deft, it's so efficient at what she's doing. It's such a far cry from the pandering, like pre-packaged feminism that's shoveled in heaping portions by her contemporaries like Nikki Caro or Chloe Zhao or Ava DuVernay. Um, I don't think the movie is like, entirely without fault. It, it's pretty shaggy, sometimes by choice, sometimes due to the budget or her sort of inexperienced hands. But overall, this is a fantastic debut. It's probably her most normal film yeah. <laughs> in in her stable of movies you know there's no there's no cults there's no vampire succubi there's no cannibalistic high schoolers it's just kind of pure first time movie filmmaking and welcome to theater and stream a film podcast i am matt that is chuck and this is episode 37 today we're beginning with part one of two of our dive into the works of director Karen Kusama. I've chosen a film, Chuck has chosen another, and today we're beginning with my pick, her debut feature, the year 2000's Girl Fight. Perhaps her most forgotten film, uh, but at the time, it won the best film prize at Sundance Film Festival and was also the career launch pad for actress Michelle Rodriguez. I'm gonna kind of come out and say this from the top. This movie is a bit hard to find unless you somehow have a DVD of it. Uh, so if you have not seen it, I'm gonna go ahead and place a link to the film in our episode description. So go ahead and give it a watch and then come back and watch this. But back into the present, we've also got some news stories to discuss. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the things we've been watching. And then we'll wrap the show up with the mentionables, where we recommend one non-movie related thing we've been doing this week. Please do like and do subscribe if you like what we're doing here on the channel. But before we begin in earnest, Chuck, I understand we have an announcement to enter into the record of note. Yeah, you know, because we're such a, a humble little operation here, you know, petty little numbers like a thousand you know, are kind of significant to us because, you know, even though we've been at this for a while, we've been putting out a lot of content over the last few years. Um, I, I'm afraid to say we've never broken a thousand, but then somehow for some reason, our episode on the film Sanctuary uh, is getting a lot of traction with the algorithm. It's recommending it to a lot of people and it's at like over 2,600, you know, as of this morning when we record on Saturday. And it's a, uh, I'm a little taken aback by it. I can only credit it to uh, Margaret Qualley's uh, uh, seductive allure. You know, the, the animal magnetism that is the, you know, the, the thumbnail image that you've generated for that episode. Otherwise, I, I, I don't understand it. So, cause it's a, it's a very, very out of character for the algorithm to favor us in this way, but we'll take it. And we appreciate everyone's feedback, even the thumbs down. You know, it, it gives us a chance to sit back and wonder why they may have done that. And then also, you know, try and figure out how we could replicate this magic because all these eyeballs are not normal for us. 
but we'll just we'll take it so thank you welcome thanks for watching and now we have to move on to the sad part of the the announcements to start off the show but uh carl weathers the the nfl veteran and the you know storied actor has passed away suddenly in his sleep we're all very bummed out about this mm -hmm. yeah it's uh he, he died on Thursday from when we were recording this, so two days ago. And uh, right now, I believe the cause is still unknown, um, but it's sort of assumed that it was very sudden because I don't know if you've seen any of these commercials, but he's in like Super Bowl commercials with uh, like Rob Gronkowski and stuff. Really? So he was still working. And so... And I'm sure we'll probably see a couple of those commercials when the Super Bowl happens next week. So, yeah, I'm assuming this was very sudden because he was he was, you know, putting in the hours at work still. And so, yeah, this really sucks. Um, I don't know if you saw the Sylvester Stallone video um, that's like sort of making the rounds, but it's pretty it's pretty like soul crushing to, to watch him talk about about Carl Weathers. But uh, mm. yeah, uh, incredible career. And I don't know if you had like what is like your Carl Weathers like one performance for you or one or two performances that you go back to? See, it's it's the two different eras. You know, it's Carl Weathers and Predator and then it's him and Happy Gilmore. I know they're only separated by like 10 years, but like that is who I think of when I think of this man. He's either like an absurdist goofball, like an arrested development. Oh man, yes. I think I think I have a naked girl behind me. Oh, yeah, okay. you do. Okay. Uh, I'll you let you take it away while I put a censored bar over this thing. Okay, sure. Yeah, so for me, I mean, I'm glad you just mentioned it because for me, it's it's okay, got to be honey. Arrested Development. Let's get a bath um, going for it. He, oh, man, he was, like, so fantastic in that. And that was sort of like, I, you know, I hesitate to say washed up, but that was sort of like the part of his career where he was really not, you know, like doing so hot, you know, he was, you know, taking these like guest spot roles on these like no name um, comedy shows because, you know, remember when Arrested Development first came out, it was not a popular show, you know, canceled after three seasons, um, despite being, you know, completely critically acclaimed, you know, people just weren't really watching it. And then it only picked up after, you know, it went on Netflix, of course. But, you know, he was accepting these weird sort of guest roles on, on, you know, shows like that, where he was playing a, a, a wash up, washed up actor, you know, in the show also, who would like meet his clients at Burger King and save, you know, the bones of like ribs to like throw into soups and stuff. So, yes, I, I um, loved that role as well, that version yeah, of himself. Just fantastic. And, um, but yeah, he was, he was, he was really great. But then he had sort of a late, you know, career resurgence with like the Mandalorian because I'm, I'm sure that's the only reason Gen Z knows who he is. Which is unfortunate because, yeah, but he added gravitas to the Mandalorian. He made it feel more legitimate because the man was a star. And mm -hmm. by God, I'm gonna I'm gonna miss him. And like, and Star Wars is gonna be pretty affected by this. Or like, I can't remember. Did his character die? I don't even. I don't even. I've I've already <laughs> brain flushed all Mandalorian lore because I cared so little about it. So I forget what happens to his character. No, he he is technically. I mean, he's still alive in the show. I think you know the last time we saw him, he was like the um, mayor, or governor, or whatever of that that town that he had uh, flipped like himself from a, a like a, a gangster to being like a statesman it was pretty yeah pretty rad mm -hmm. okay all right yeah so they'll, they'll have to figure something out but yeah yeah rest in peace uh carl weathers gonna definitely have to watch predator sometime soon because Word. i mean that's got to be like the the thing you know everyone goes back to is is probably predator and so yeah it's been a while since i've watched that the <laughs> I'll never forget watching that movie with my, my dad and uncle on VHS for the first time and them having to self, you know, like, you know, mute the, oh, yeah. all of the, the jokes, you know, yeah. just to make sure I wouldn't hear Shane Black something saying something scandalizing. But yeah, it's that rasp between Schwarzenegger and him with their, their muscles popping. 
Yeah. That's the best thing ever. Do you want to show your goggles, November, <laughs> since you're disrupting me? Look at what bathtub she's going to hop in the bathtub in. Bathtub goggles. <laughs> All right. Moving on to, I guess, the, 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 the what generated the most hay for people this week in, you know, entertainment media. You know, it, it came time for the, the Oscar nominations to finally be trotted out. And for the most part, Matt... What did we get? What did you see? Where, well, like, what was the most surprising thing? What was the most expected thing? The, where, where did it land as far as quality of, you know, voting from yeah. the the members this year? Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's pretty expected. I mean, this is pretty in line with what um, all the other shows have been doing. Uh, Oppenheimer leads with 13 noms, followed by Poor Things uh, with 11, and then Killers of the Flower Moon with 10. Um, if you know, if people weren't aware, uh, the process of getting nominated and eventually winning an Oscar can be incredibly expensive and time-consuming. You know, it's all about keeping yourself relevant over the entire award season, which is typically like early November to late February. You know, and whatever that means to you, talk show appearances, going on SNL, buying billboards in the LA area. And it's it's almost like a political campaign. And I think like the biggest example of this and probably the most interesting category as far as the Oscars are concerned is best actor. Mm. Because the biggest or among some of the biggest snubs, Charles Melton and Leonardo DiCaprio both completely snubbed for best actor even though they have been getting nominated for other award shows and they've sort of been swapped out um for jeffrey wright um for uh american fiction yeah, and then that hacky uh, american fiction movie and then coleman domingo um i mm. think was was the other the other one the other big surprise and so yeah that's probably the biggest um snubs slash surprises um other than just kind of like smaller stuff like zone of interest getting a, an adapted screenplay nom is weird because i mean i'm not i'm not opposed to it but the script really isn't what people are talking about with that film you know i've in fact i've heard it's like very sparse you know it's it's basically it's like under the skin you know glazer's other movie where it's the dialogue is sparse and when characters do talk it's very like incidental dialogue mm. you know it's very like we're gonna talk about our day or we're gonna talk about what we're doing so i don't really understand why that got nominated for screenplay it's um, the subtlety of its you know analysis of the banal evil of yada 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 yada, yada. it's a holocaust movie you gotta probably. give it something uh -huh. um I don't know. I, I don't know if there's any that you particularly like looked at and kind of like made you raise an eyebrow. But I guess for me, um, it's America Ferrera for Barbie. And I mean, I understand why it happened, because she is like the actual human being in that movie. And she has that like, you know, big monologue where she talks about how hard it is to be a woman and stuff like that so i understand why it happened but it's just not something i agree it's, it's, with it's very slight you know it was the bone yeah. that they that they threw you know as far as that goes but yeah american fiction just seems like the dopiest like wasp like it's, it's the favorite movie of your white-haired aunt from yeah. you know from some, it's the npr it's movie. the npr movie like yeah. the, I don't know. It it just it, it just never interested me, and the, but for some reason it just has caught the you know attention of a whole bunch of people who act like it has something very smart to say, and I guess I'll have to watch it myself to truly disabuse myself of my opinion or not. But yeah, like the color purple getting in there is kind of whatever. I'm glad mm -hmm. that uh, Divine Joy Randolph got in because, like, that was a very subtle performance. That yeah, that, was I, I, that was great, and I, and I'm glad it's getting attention. Um, one. What about uh, Godzilla? See, yeah, I'm very For happy. Visual effects that made me happy. That was deserving. It's like it, it's funny that in the, the same you know year that we have Oppenheimer you know not get notably not getting in for special effects the godzilla movie does yeah. uh, there's just 
I don't know, like, when did they even announce that Godzilla Minus One was even being made? I feel like they were just like, oh, here it is. And mm. uh, it just, you know, gets to squeak in at the end of the year and act like nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it definitely came out of nowhere. I mean, yeah, I mean, just like Shin Godzilla, I remember like Shin Godzilla, nobody was talking about it. And then suddenly, you know, obviously the popularity of Godzilla minus one is like order of magnitudes more popular, but Shin Godzilla also came out of nowhere. And that that was the one that had every, you know, uh, film buff talking, whereas this one has just everyone in general talking. And I don't know if you've seen the quote. It's crazy that it got nominated for visual effects too because there's this quote that's going around, very popular now, of the director of, of Godzilla Minus uh, One. An interviewer asks him what the film's budget was and he, he doesn't want to say. And then the interviewer asks like, did you have 15 million? And he just goes, I wish we had 15 million. I had so, seen that. Yeah, it's it's crazy that, you know, it got nominated on a budget of under fifteen million dollars. And so yeah, I really like seeing that too, but I also I like know, I seeing Jed should... Reckoning in there. I, I like the fact that oh, yeah. mm -hmm. that the creator got some you know plaudits as well. Uh, I haven't yeah, been able to watch that movie all the way through, but the, the snippets I've seen have been pretty extraordinary. Very deserving. Yeah. Uh Napoleon yeah. just seems a matter of course. You know, it's it's the Ridley <laughs> Scott movie. They might as well have it in there. But of course, yeah. who got like the the biggest snub? The what made pe people the most mad was um, yeah. Greta Gerwig and uh, Margot Robbie not getting nominated in the correct categories, because technically, like, they, they, are they both producers on the movie? I believe so. So yeah, yeah they, they are packaged in. The girls mm -hmm. made it. They're going to the dance too. But, did yeah, I don't know. Like my my wife put it best. I think even as someone who does agree that oh yeah they were wrong. They like she she does my and she does think that they should should have been nominated. But her first thought was, but who got in there instead? In the case of Margot Robbie, who is she passed over for? You know, a lot of you know stars like Annette Benning, you know, who are just getting kind of notice. I think because you know they're respected at this point i don't know what is naiad even about oh it's about that uh woman who uh you know in her like early 60s i want to say she crossed the uh english channel i ah, believe is what it see? is um, old woman doing hard thing yeah. you know <laughs> you know and, and, and but i think this is lily gadstone's category and carry i don't know maestro is the movie that doesn't deserve anything that it's nominated for even her i don't know i just am i have such a bitter taste in my mouth from that fucking movie and i knew that it was going to be placed exactly where it is it doesn't deserve to be there at least with emma yeah. stone with like poor things is like really gonzo and out there and uh, you know it's experimental and weird and it's uncomfortable from what mm -hmm. i gather about that movie but maestro is just not a good time for anyone i don't think and, and yeah, I think that I, I would say... they, there was a lot of Netflix lobbying to get them where they're at. I think a lot of oh, a lot of Academy members just happen to have seen because like, don't they use rank choice voting in this now? Isn't that a part of it? I yeah, I think so. Yeah, they, they do that. And then they also uh, one of the weird changes that they made. I don't know if it was somewhat recently, but you can only now you can only vote for whatever like field you're in. So oh. like actors voting for actors directors voting for directors Makes you know and so on and so forth and so yeah it's it's interesting how they've changed that over the years but yeah i mean to go back to your point about maestro i think i'd probably agree with you maybe though i would probably only put it up for like maybe makeup um mm. and um that knows. maybe cinematography yeah the nose and the, just the old the old uh crinkly skin that they put on bradley cooper was yeah. very convincing but um but yeah i mean to go back to barbie um as far as you know robbie and gerwig are concerned you know this movie it got eight other nominations so yeah. it's not like i mean people have to keep it in perspective because this the reaction to this was so strange because it prompted like 
this weird statement from Ryan Gosling that was almost like an Al- like Al Qaeda hostage video where he's like he's like yes I got nominated and thank you for that but you know at the same time he had to kind of walk on thin ice with it because he's like yeah this sucks that you know they didn't get nominated you know, it's it's and kind of it, like Macklemore having to act like oh I feel bad that I beat Kendrick Lamar you know like that's oh, kind yeah. of what it feels like to me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Writing an apology but, letter that's just as offensive as winning in the first place. Yeah. But I mean, the, I mean, the, here's the thing: is uh, what what I'll say about this from you know my perspective is this was always going to happen. All of these people who are screeching online about this just fundamentally misunderstand what the Oscars are. They are the stuffy, self-important award show where like the median age of their voter is like early 60s. And so Barbie never had a shot. I'm surprised it even got the noms that it did get. And, you know, it's it's just that that was it was this was always going to happen. And so I don't know why people are acting surprised and outraged about it, but uh, so, yeah. Do you have any bravery in you to make some predictions given uh, the nominees? Yeah. I mean, I would say, um, I think, as you said, um, probably Lily Gladstone for actress. I, I don't think Emma Stone's, is that close people want to act like they're close Mm. you know and like it's kind of a it's an even race between them i don't think it's nearly as even as people think it is uh i think oppenheimer will win best film best picture i think nolan will win best director oh he's still my heart Um, that's what i want to happen i think it it will i I totally think it will I, i don't think anything else really has that much of a chance other than maybe i mean the upset would be killers Um, But I I honestly don't think it has a chance. Um, And then, uh, let's see, maybe actor, um, I don't know, Giamatti, maybe? Uh, He's been having a good good run. And then... um, He's been to In-N-Out or whatever your your burger joint they go to to act like normal people (laughs) after they win Oscars. Yeah. What about you? What do you think? I think the Dark Horse movie that's probably going to take more than we expect is past lives as much disdain for it as we both have yeah because <laughs> it, it there's just something i think about it that is just going to rise you know in spite of its toxic qualities because yeah the the, the there's just a lot of toxic feminists out there and i think they have more influence <laughs> along with the asian lobby to make something really happen for the you know the, the, those particular identity groups that's my one like dark horse prediction but i do mm. want to say it is pretty rad that jonathan glazer is getting so much love these days and that'll come up again later but uh, it's I, I really want to see this movie for myself but i what if they i, I don't know i want to see him win even if it is just for adapted screenplay because uh, i've never read any of his scripts myself but i'm curious about what that might reveal about how he approaches things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be cool. That would certainly be awesome. But yeah, we will, uh, we'll touch back in on this. I think the, I want to say the Oscars are February 8th or something like that. So we will certainly be talking about it again. And we are back with the magically appearing baby to talk about our next item. A, a like an open letter from the director Doug Lyman uh, regarding his latest you know masterpiece a remake of Roadhouse and so like well, what is the gist here what is his gripe yeah so um Lyman remade uh, Roadhouse with Jake Gyllenhaal and he a, a, about a week ago this guest column appeared on deadline.com uh from him and I, I would encourage anyone to go look at it because it's pretty fascinating. This is basically part like filleting his own film and talking about like how like, oh, Gyllenhaal gives a Oscar worthy performance and people are going to want to see Conor McGregor's acting debut. And then it's partially complaining about Amazon Studios because essentially what happened was 
Doug Liman skipped the premiere of Roadhouse and is now boycotting the film because Amazon decided to basically just dump it on streaming this March instead of giving it a theatrical release, which um, he was told he would be getting. And yeah, it's pretty it's pretty fascinating this article um, from that perspective. Um, because it's just a lot of a lot of complaining, but there is some gems in here as far as you know him talking about how hard it is to deal within like the studio system and essentially just how how studios are like feigning concern for like the theatrical experience and they could you know really couldn't give a fuck if theaters died and and stuff like that. But yeah, what what did you make of this? Yeah, because don't we understand that cinema is really just about selling people toilet seats like i kind of agree with him that like but he's like he didn't know who he was working with like come on brother like you have to know yeah i understand he was initially dealing with mgm you know like like that's the that's the problem he was grandfathered into something and kind of got hoodwinked you know out of what he thought he was being paid to create and you look like, and you can see that he tried. Yeah, he has Conor McGregor in his fucking movie. That's asses in the seats, mm-hmm. you know, oh, by sure. any metric. Like he did everything he could to turn what is supposed to just be Roadhouse into Fast and the Furious. I mean, like, isn't that what they were paying him to make? I don't know. Like he, they obviously tried way too hard to m- finally follow through on, you know, the the this threat to make this thing, and. Mm-hmm. The, the, but I feel like he should have known better than to expect anything other than what's happening, given who he's dealing with. Like, what is the incentive to put movies out into theaters? Seriously, what is it? Well, yeah, I mean, for them, for I mean, Amazon, really, I should say, yeah, 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 there isn't much. I mean, just because, yeah, I mean, they want to sell more, you know, toilet, like you said, toilet seats, especially now, because I don't know if you knew this, but as of this week. Um, Amazon is now running ads if you have Amazon Prime, unless you pay for the more expensive subscription. Yeah. Um, so that's something that they're doing now. So, yeah, you're most certainly going to get uh, ads for, you know, all the fantastic products that you can buy on Amazon's website uh, now between, you know, watching, um, you know, episodes of Invincible and The Boys or whatever, whatever you watch. And so... Uh, there is no incentive for them to put it in theaters because this is not, I mean, the only incentive streamers have to put movies in theaters nowadays is to get qualified for an awards run. And this movie is not going to be winning any awards. Which he's very soon. delusional about. I will grant you that. <laughs> like he is ridiculous if he thinks this movie is anything other than what it clearly is, which, you know, oh, is yeah. a good, a good Friday night, you know, like a good, you know, you know case of Natty Lights, with the boys throw a movie on that's what this likes like it would be good for but to, to act like i don't know like if he was trying to make art in all of this oh god like maybe there's a reason why they don't want to you know put it in theaters but mm-hmm. i don't know maybe maybe we're wrong maybe gyllenhaal you know was giving us gold man worthy you know you know work with you know, in this movie but i don't know how you pull that off yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because Lyman is Lyman is so hit or miss because this is the guy who did, you know, like the Born Identity um, and uh, Edge, of, uh, Edge of Tomorrow, which is really, really great. Mm-hmm. But then he's also the guy who did like, um, oh, God, what is the name? Jumper, that that Hayden Christensen movie. <laughs> he did that? Movie. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah, he did like Jumper and he also did like more recently he's done a really really like shitty TV show called The Recruit um and so Oh, which is a remake of a movie. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and that, I think that, that Colin Farrell Al Pacino been... movie. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. And I, I can't remember, but that was also for a streaming service. So, it was for Netflix, I think. So, he's worked with streaming services before, so he kind of knows the deal, but at the same time, I do feel for him because uh, he was, you know, told that he was going to get a theatrical release. And the one thing, I guess, sort of the one lesson to take away from this is, you know, these studios, these streaming companies have no problem going back on their word 
so long as there's no legal recourse for doing so. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess the the sort of lesson from this is get everything in writing because <laughs> Yeah, they they do not care. They will yeah. they will lie, cheat, and steal their way to the top if it if as long as there's Don't no him. penalty. Watch his head, honey. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they just need to pick. You need to give them some sort of incentive, like put it in theaters or you pay me fifty million dollars. You know, yeah. for all the money we'd lose from it not being you know you know in box you know generating box office revenue. Because yeah, because of uh, Zaslavnomics. All these companies are just looking for opportunities for a write down and, you know, mm-hmm. or some kind of a break because I'm sure they get some kind of a tax break if this movie is streaming only and doesn't generate any box office, you know, theatrical box office income. There, there, there's, there's something, you know, is a part of the economics of it that makes this preferable. And as long as you're making deals with a company that is likely to make that, expect that. That's the lesson. Even Doug Lyman isn't immune. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly. But moving on to the, the watch list, this is just another, I guess, entry of this, you know, remake culture, this, you know, you know, rejiggering of things from the past, whether anyone likes it or not, whether you need it or not. And for some reason they took sexy beast and they gave us a prequel series set in the like early nineties. Uh, the timeline's very confusing. These people look like they should be the same age of the characters in the, the movie. So I don't know. It, it, something's a little off there as far as like when things should be taking place or not, but they're v- this is very much something that isn't like Jonathan Glazer. You know, it isn't like the movie. It, it, it tries its best to imitate the movie he made, but the reason why he made the movie he he did, you know, it comes. It was in spite of the people who you know write that movie and the other the parts of their oeuvre, like forty four inch chest. Like the the guys who wrote the screenplay for Sexy Beast are the reason why this show exists. I feel like more than Jonathan sure. Glazer is. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. from what I understand, he has nothing to do with this. Yeah. Cause this is just such dopey, meathead, you know, like, you know, geezer gangster nonsense. And uh, it just cheapens the the mystique of the original movie for me to watch this thing. It's like, I, I enjoyed it in parts, but it just kind of reminded me of like how insipid the Continental was as well. It's like, this is just an exercise, a reason to dress up in clothes from another time you know and we'll you know and imitate things to a certain degree like there's random cutaways to rabbits escaping vipers in the desert you know because there was those kinds of weird things in the movie but like like how does it relate to this it's very hard to say and uh, yeah i i gave up on it but i tried it but unless you have seen the movie why would you watch this yeah, I have no idea. I, 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 I'm not interested in this really in the slightest. <laughs> you should be. Because it's like, I just feel like this is one of those things where they, they're like, okay, what properties do we own? And then they just like attached a name to something. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, not 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 interested. And yeah, Paramount Plus has been doing all this. Is, this is Paramount Plus, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah, they've been doing a lot of this type of stuff lately, and it like just things that nobody asked for because i want to say that they are also the ones behind the um, at least the american side of um the full monty show remember we talked about that like a couple weeks ago and so yeah it's like it's like why are you remaking these like british like mid-budget movies from like the 90s and early 2000s so weird and and that's just the thing it's like no one is asking for this stuff I feel mm-hmm. like, and, and and you're right. It is just, we own it. We're going to use it, you know, mm-hmm. which is, you know, why we look to things like the next entry on the watch list as yes. like the, the palate cleanse, the thing that elevates all of our experiences. What are your thoughts with the, the opening thrust of Masters of the Air? Yeah, I, uh, well, first of all, let me ask you, have you seen episode three? I have not. I have only okay. seen like one and a half episodes. Okay. I'll be careful then because 
uh, here's what I'll say is, um, I think there are two interesting lenses from which to watch this show through. The first is sort of the history buff lens, and the second is, you know, the dramatic lens. And something like Band of Brothers fulfilled both of those aspects because that was a mini series that had, you know, amazing, well drawn characters while also telling a relatively accurate record of the events that took place. And then you have the Pacific, which had weaker characters, but was okay. And then this, to me, is sort of, in the first two episodes, it's sort of more along the lines of the Pacific, where, yeah. you know, I am i don't know how interesting these guys are, and I don't even know if I can tell the difference between most of them. But then it's sort of, after episode three, it's sort of settling into a groove where I'm sort of like, okay, this guy is the guy who pukes on the plane, uh, the navigator, and then this guy is the guy who's, you know, the the soft-spoken, like, you know, um, really regal guy who has a mysterious past, and then this guy's the loud mouth. And so, you know, the, everybody's kind of settling into their groove. And let me tell you, episode three really is the turning point because... Okay things get really rough people start dying and things go very very wrong See, and that's what i was um, hoping to hear yeah it, it, it's it's pretty great and um you know people that characters that you thought had plot armor like die and you're like holy shit and so uh i i'm really sort of on board with it now more so than ever um but yeah wh wh where are you at well, I'm I'm encouraged to hear that there's there's some light at the the end of the tunnel because the the, the from the opening scene I was discouraged because <laughs> it's just like oh like because I don't know because the the way that Band of Brothers did everything was so by the book you know that like you can tell that they just whoever created that looked at the Stephen Ambrose book if you've ever read it. The, the, the series does such a, an immaculate job of recreating it that it's almost like they used it as the script. You like, sure. like you, the, you know, it's like that's just how good it was, but just how much they he, they hewed to the text, and with the Pacific and with this, I just I'm, I'm I don't know like is, I'm just not sure that if if there's text worth hewing to, because like I don't care about any of these guys. They all look the same. They sound the same. They all have this. They're all written the same. And then that is what was missing was distinct characters to me. And a, a part of me wondered if it wasn't because a lot of them were about to die because b based on like what I've you know, read in books like citizen soldiers and stuff like that, other Stephen Ambrose joints about bombers and whatnot. Cause the, yeah, it just, all they did was fly planes, drop bombs and then drink themselves till they blacked out and then woke up and did it again. Cause that was the only way that they could function in the, the, the hell in the sky that they lived in. So I am going to hop back on aboard this as soon as I get some time this weekend and catch up. Cause I'm a yeah. history buff and I want to see some action. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. It's yeah. Episode three is sort of the turning point. There was also sort of a, there's a there's a sort of groove that's broken in episode three where I thought I sort of had the show pegged as far as what it was going to be where, um, you know, it's like every episode we get one mission and then they do the mission and then they go back to the base and then the rest of the episode is just them hanging out at the base. And it's clear by the end of episode three that that is not going to be the case and i'm i'm really really glad that that's not the case because it could have i think gotten really repetitive and really boring yeah but now we have like by the end of episode three a lot of people are sort of scattered to the winds and that we're gonna have like different characters in different places and stuff like that so different theaters um, of war yeah yeah, okay. and so really looking forward to that. And I guess the last thing I, I would say on it right now, I'm sure we'll talk about this once it's all finished up too, but I, I, I've got to say that the CGI at, in parts is really horrendous. That's and too bad. <laughs> That's really um, too bad. Because did you ever see Midway? That movie from a, a few years ago? No, no I didn't. Because like, uh, I, I compare it to that. But, but then again, that is you know, Roland Emmerich's like international production where he's still somehow able to get like hundreds of millions of dollars 
to you you make a move but the aerial fight the the dive bombing sequences and that are exhilarating and amazing and immaculate and that's the standard and if you can't do better than Roland Embrick, you know, with his, you know, third rate European, you know, union help, then, you know, like, why are we acting like being on Apple TV plus means anything? They should be able to afford good special effects for something like this, because even though like Band of Brothers did a lot of practical things for the most part, they they, you know, they cut corners to avoid needing that kind of money and that kind of production value because it wasn't yeah. possible for them. But you'd think it would be possible for them today. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the the parts in which I think it's really bad is when the planes are actually like taking off and you see them like taxiing on the runways because I don't think they actually like got these like World War Two planes and like did that. I think for the most part, the sequences of the planes taking off is all CGI. And so that's why it looks so bad. Um, but once they're up in the air and they're actually flying, I think it looks decent. And then I think the reason why that is, is because you actually have the actors inside of like a physical, like plane set that's like surrounded by, I'm assuming that's surrounded by green screens. And so it looks fine when they're up in the air but yeah when i'm sure you've probably seen a couple of these scenes where the plane is taxiing on the runway and it's like oh my god is this like microsoft flight sim or something you know it might as well be because the and that's what i guess is maybe it's, it's a liability issue and they they can't even get you know you know any of these like you know like show pilots to you know, fly these antiques because they just want to avoid any accidents because you don't want to go down as you know like that but that happens at flight shows all the time have some balls like i i, I wish we lived at a back in my day we threw men in planes and put them in the sky what we needed to do like because that like even christopher nolan used real planes like real spitfires to do yes the dunkirk, yeah, dunkirk. shit so I, I mean just put a guy in a plane get a shot of it taxiing you know at the at least but mm -hmm. it's, it's a gripe it's a it's a gripe we'll make because if it's if we're going to be masters of the air like actually make it like look better than what like a, a russian tv show would do like i i know that they can do better than that yeah and speaking of knowing that they can do better next on the watch list for me angie and i we're finally getting the kids to bed we're like what can we do what can we do to, you know, spend our time? Oh, look, a new Chicken Run movie because we've been conned into having Netflix again. So we put on this new Chicken Run movie. And the first thing I noticed, the first problem I have is that Millie Gibbs is absent. And the guy who plays Shazam is a poor substitute for Mel Gibson. They've <laughs> completely, they've forgive the term, they've completely cucked his character out from that first movie and i kid you not we watched this movie up until like act like two and a half and then we just kind of once we the villain was revealed we were like oh who cares and we turned this off and we put the original on so this is my while i salute all the you know animators they did a really good job making it it's just a really unfun movie and it just is not this is the characters from the original they have changed them a bit too much, which is unfortunate because all of the other supporting chickens that you remember from the first movie, they're all voiced by the same ladies. You're know, like, they're all still authentically themselves. So why did my man have to change? Why did he have to go? Co like, I don't know. I know he became a dad or whatever the fuck it is, but that's my gripe. I, I couldn't enjoy it. And ultimately, Angie was just like, no, this is sucks. So I, I don't know. Maybe we're wrong. Other people might enjoy it, but we we had a very negative, not good time with Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget. Yeah, it seems like another entry this week into the the pantheon of why was this like continued or why why did you take this property from you know what thirty years ago at this point and make this all of a sudden out of nowhere out of nowhere and i know it's Ardman. like we we love them like we, we like when they do things and they might as well make a sequel to 
I don't know, like Chicken Run is my favorite movie that they've made ever. And mm-hmm. it's the one I think of when I when I think of these guys. And so I, I was down for it up until that rooster opened his mouth and it was Zachary <laughs> Levi. Like that's when they lost me. And like I and I just I didn't want to say anything because I, I just didn't want to be a negative Nancy, but eventually there was no other conclusion to come to. You know, which is also why we have comfort shows that like for me is Star Trek the Next Generation. So you mean to tell me that this is your first watch through of this series ever in your life? Ever. Yep. That's special. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How was that yeah, going so, for you? Oh, it's going fantastic. So this just for some context, you know, people who have watched the show before know that I watched um, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And what I've always heard from people is like that show is sort of the um, the show to watch if you like Next Generation. So I sort of thought, you know, well, I'll do it in reverse and I'll start watching Next Generation. And I, I decided to do this way, you know, late last year. And so this show has basically been the, you know, the, the show that I watch maybe one or two episodes a night when there's nothing else on TV. And so, and then about halfway through season one, I'm happy to say that uh, my wife also got on board. And so now we can watch this together. And um, I'm, I'm on season four now. And what I will say about it thus far is I think all of the episodes are at least watchable. I know that there's, um, you know, episodes that people absolutely love out there. And there's episodes that people absolutely hate. Yeah. And I think the the quality of the show varies so wildly. Um, but once I got over sort of the the season one hump, because you can definitely tell that season one is super low budget and the actors are still trying to kind of find their characters. I, I, I think the show's um, consistency has really, really picked up. And um, gosh, you know, like, I did see the episode Best of Both Worlds, and I think that episode is as as good as people say. Um, it holds up so well even now, like 30 years later, especially with that that um, like cliffhanger ending between season three and four. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm really really enjoying it. And that's the that's the last thing I'm gonna say on it now because uh, I'll just say right now, my next mini-sode is going to be all about my experience watching this for the first time, you know, in 2024, and just talking about my favorite individual episodes, and then, you know, which which episodes I think you, you know, could probably skip, and whether or not you should skip them, because I'm finding that that is kind of a common refrain, is that people say, there's all these lists everywhere all over the internet of people saying this is how you should watch next generation these are the episodes to watch these are the episodes to skip because they're mostly filler and i kind of want to challenge that idea that you can skip certain episodes because i don't i don't think that's quite how you should go about it and so yeah this will be my next mini sode topic this is one of those shows that you got to take your time with because it's from an era where a season was like you know, the, the, is twice the size of what a season of television yeah. is today. So, mm-hmm. and so there's obviously some quote unquote filler, but I, I'm curious to hear your defense of the, the holistic approach to this. Mm-hmm. But now it's time to transition to our main event in our retrospective on Karen Kusama, her debut film, Girl Fight. Take it away, Matt. Yeah, the debut film of Karen Kusama. Um, Kusama actually joined a gym, a pretty famous gym called Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn in 1992, and then produced this film after eight years of gathering ideas, writing, and an untold number of attempts to secure financing for the for the movie. Um, and then even after every piece was in place. The film's financier backed out. The lead actress was fired from the movie for being too polished. And then filmmaker John Sayles had to come in at the last minute with an injection of cash. What a that literally meant the difference between the movie getting produced or not getting produced. And so 
Um, you know, when you look at what this movie is, I can see why it had so much trouble being made because Girl Fight, it's a movie, it's a sports movie that doesn't care about sports. It features a female lead that is hard-nosed, bordering on unlikable, and it deals with subjects that still make producers nowadays uncomfortable. You know, gender equality, double standards between the sexes, um, male emotional uh, fragility, the quiet desperation of living in the projects. You know, it's all stuff that makes people uncomfortable. And I think her handling of the topics, especially for a first time filmmaker in the year 2000, are enough to make a similar modern filmmaker's head explode because her hand is so deft, it's so efficient at what she's doing. It's such a far cry from the pandering, like pre-packaged feminism that's shoveled in heaping portions by her contemporaries like Nikki Caro or Chloe Zhao or Ava DuVernay. Um, I don't think the movie is like, entirely without fault. It, it's pretty shaggy, sometimes by choice, sometimes due to the budget or her sort of inexperienced hands, but Overall, this is a fantastic debut. It's probably her most normal film yeah. <laughs> in in her stable of movies. You know, there's no there's no cults, there's no vampire succubi, there's no cannibalistic high schoolers. It's just kind of pure first time movie filmmaking. And yeah, really really enjoyed it. Um, what did you think, Chuck? No, I like. I, I guess what I took away from it, you know, you, like I liked how you brought up her contemporaries. And, and and I think that that's kind of the well, it's the subject matter of this movie and it's what informed her ability to make the movie she made. She knows what it's like to get punched in the face. You know, like, like I, and I know that like women can be violent too, but not very many women know what it's like to get punched in the face. A surprising amount of men don't know what it's like to get punched in the face. But it, it, you had kind of, to, to be able to have the grit to, to make a movie like this and be so unapologetic about so many of the, the ways that it challenges things. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd maybe seen this one time in, in the past and I didn't retain a lot from it. I was kind of put off by some of the amateurism, you know, but at the same time watching it now, go ahead and put on your makeup. I have a little girl who wants to put on her makeup. She doesn't want a box. <laughs> Put on your makeup, honey. That's okay. Well, yeah, no, it's I don't like, know about that, honey. Go ahead. It's, yeah, I mean, it's the it's the movie that like invented the Michelle Rodriguez typecast. The yeah, the like the dead eye, like angry glare, and it's you know it's so unapologetic in how like you know like I said how bordering on unlikable its main character is. She's She's quiet, she's simmering, she's like constantly pissed off until like the end of the movie when the one time in the movie where you hear laughter from her is like right after she's beaten the shit out of somebody and she's just <laughs> sitting, you know, sitting alone in the locker room and and just laughing to herself. And so, yeah, I mean, it's like, it, it is very unapologetic in, in what it's doing. But the, at the same time, it's like, it's an entry in urban filmmaking too you know it's focusing on minorities and, and, and i get the time i guess that yeah that's groundbreaking you know even at sundance mm -hmm. and the characters though now even beyond the protagonist like even the people giving her like quote unquote good advice everyone just sucks <laughs> the, the, bear with me here a second i'm a little distracted yeah, yeah no i mean yeah, everybody is, um, yeah, so like, like I said, you know, quiet desperation is kind of the feel of the movie. You know, everything is like a slum. Would everything is, chapstick, honey? is the projects. Everything is, I, I love the portrayal of the gyms and the venues in this movie because it's like one, it somehow is one step down even from like Cassandro, you know, which we watched I'm, I'm last year. I can't help you where right if Cassandro Why is like regional wrestling with, you know, audiences 
of like in the hundreds. This is like municipal boxing where these, these are like genuine shitholes where they're fighting in front of crowds of like tens of people instead of hundreds of people. And there's like cardboard signs yeah. everywhere that have these, you know, these sayings on them and all the mismatched chairs that they have to scrounge together for the audience to sit in is it's, it's all so, I just love the feel of it. And there's no pre, you know, no pre-fight fanfare. They just get up into the ring and the guy just goes box and, and then they start. And yeah, it's just, the portrayal of how shitty the conditions are is, is pretty accurate, I would say. You know, accurate, but it also, I feel like it effectively, you know, I guess communicated exactly like what the drive is, you know, because it's like you're not going to elevate yourself out of your situation, you know, when you're boxing in venues like that, you know, for stakes as low as that. It's like, like, like what makes it worth it to her or anybody else? You know, and I and I and I and that's what I mean by like you, it's you, once you get punched in the face and you know that that won't stop you from swinging back. You know, like that's when you can do something like that. And uh, I don't know, it's about the you know, and that's what's commendable about it. Especially, it is shocking like how much of this movie is her just beating the shit out of dudes, but having it not like feel contrived and silly when it happens. It's like oh no, like she is just that much of a psycho. Like, like if you, if you hold back even a little bit, she will fuck you up, you know? And, and what does that say about her? What is, I don't know. It, it was all very effective. And I, because initially on those opening scenes, I was just like with, when the girls are just hanging out in the locker room, just having their silly little bitch talk. I was like, I was grimacing a little bit. I was like, oh, I forgot. Like, is it like this throughout the whole movie? Like, do we start getting some like, you know, better acting? It's like, this is an indie. You know, like I, I, of an era where it actually meant something, and that's why like, I didn't know the full backstory behind the production because like John Sales is my boy, I love that guy, and the the fact that like he was like is so integral to making this happen was was very interesting, but also the fact that Rodriguez was essentially just plucked out of obscurity and plugged in there, mostly because yeah. she just had the face for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 crazy. I think I had read she she beat out like 300 other um, auditioners and and like I said in the intro, she, they they had a lead actress, but she was fired because she was too polished. She was, was too it? much of an actress. I don't know. I don't think they ever said, mm. but yeah, it's pretty it's pretty crazy. And and it, I mean, of course, this launched. This launched Michelle Rodriguez like into stardom because now you know now she's in like Fast and the Furious movies, and she she'll never make a movie like this ever again. I don't think. I mean, she just does shitty action movies nowadays. But this, uh, you know, it was nice to see her in a role where she was actually like doing something other than like wearing a white wife beater or something like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and glowering and quipping at a camera because yeah, that's yeah. all that she's been required to do. You know, you know, ever since, because like I think like a year after Girl Fight came out, she did do Fast and the Furious. So like, yeah, this is the the movie yeah, that and, got uh, her into Hollywood. And uh, Resident Evil. I don't know if you and, remember yeah, that, but she right. was in Resident Evil. I yeah. forgot about that. Well then, mm -hmm. either so, way, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty interesting and in, in, to look at it through that lens, because yeah, it was her debut, and um, you know, you had touched on all of like the men she beats up, and. That is something I wanted to ask you about because that is one of the things of the film that I'm kind of split on. I don't know whether or not I liked it. And it's sort of the the very far-fetched like intergender matches because even now, 24 years later, I don't think we're any closer to that really being a reality as far as becoming an actual yeah. thing. You know, we still have we still have gendered sports. And I don't think we'll ever have, you're, you're never going to see uh, like co-ed football or co-ed baseball or whatever. Outside of I a think freak fight. No, you won't. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that's kind of what like the, the, the forgiveness I give this is that in the context that the fights are happening in, it seems like it, instead of like it truly being a sanctioned thing that people would like, the, the, I think people are considering it more like a freak show kind of a thing, mm. a sideshow you know, you know, thing like even they're not really giving her full credit, you know, because otherwise, yeah, they absolutely would not be okay with it. Because the idea that 
like like I kind of have implied, like men would you know, refuse to engage in that kind of you know a, a matchup, just because they would feel like they'd have too much of an advantage and potentially hurt the woman. So yeah, I I, I agree and, and disagree. You know, to, you know, to but I understand where you're coming from, because yeah, the, it, the, they couldn't make this movie today without someone getting pissed off about it. <laughs> oh, oh, certainly. Yeah. But w- what about from like a, a dramatic perspective, as far as um, the final match, uh, you know, she faces off again against her love interest, basically. Yeah. And I understand. I understand why it was done. It's, you know, she did it to dramatize the love story and to kind of have some stakes, but do you think it would have been more effective to have the sort of final match, you know, go woman on woman? Because it seems like it would be more in the spirit of the movie itself. I mean, it, certainly in the of the film's title. I mean, the title yeah. is Girl Fight. And so um, what do you think about that from like a dramatic perspective? From a dramatic perspective, I feel like that would have made the movie a little more pedestrian. Yeah, a little, okay, a, a, sure. like the... I the it was a more radical choice to do what they did, yeah. You know, you know, as far as you know, I guess not. That, but because yeah, the alternative is yeah, the the guy just shows up and begrudgingly watches her do well in spite of their disagreements and problems, and then just says, "Oh, I respect you." At the end, like the the respect was earned in a in a more concrete way, like with the the approach that they took with the movie. I feel. Yeah, you, you have a good point there. Yeah, definitely more. It was more subversive then. And and uh, it led to a, a, a sort of a bunch of interesting scenes at the end, I think. Like, I really yeah. loved the at the end of their match. I loved how he just says satisfied to her and then just walks away. I thought that was that was really, really good. That was a really good emotional beat. And um, and then just kind of like the the final scene I, I i'm curious to get your thoughts on that where they it, it's so it's so refreshingly ambiguous almost where you know they he meets up with her in the gym again uh the original gym and he says like are you gonna break up with me now and she <laughs> says probably and then she she kisses him and then it like freeze frames on like the look that she she has on her face as she is like hugging him. And so, yeah, what did you think? What is behind that? What do you think is trying to be said there? You know, I, I wasn't quite sure because, you know, you know, like either she's just messing with him or, you know, it's true, you know, and it, it's you're just, I don't know, trying to be a little. I guess authentic about how breakups go but yeah it's like because he respected her enough as a fighter is she like basically saying that oh i view you as less of a man now and and i don't know that's a weird thing to kind of you know kind of plant in the idea of your viewer at the end of the movie i will grant you that because but i appreciated the ambiguity nonetheless Mm -hmm. yeah because it it i i kind of had to go like rewind it and just kind of you know study her face during that scene the the freeze frame because it almost seems to me as if you know she is sort of coming to the realization that whatever um whatever satisfaction she garnered from that match or whatever respect she thinks she has earned from uh, the men in her lives is only temporary and she's gonna have to she's mm. basically gonna be chasing that feeling again she's gonna be chasing that her entire life maybe even Ooh. and it's 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 almost like her coming to that realization that like oh shit this is just temporary you know all of this you know like I need I'm gonna have to do this my entire life I'm gonna have to uh, break up with this guy you know and so yeah that's, that's kind it, of what you know that's fascinating because mm-hmm. yeah like what well, like what because what would the alternative be? You know, like, is it even asking that question? I guess, yeah, I guess it kind of is. It's like, is, so is is it subtly kind of alluding to, you know, or like, you, it's kind of a conservative counterpoint. It's like, she should be barefoot in the kitchen, subversive to her husband and having a good time. Like, like is that the alternative? Or can she be authentically herself and be a woman who, you know, thrives and strives and fights and pursuits and stuff? 
but then they're by alien is are they saying that that would either alienate men from her or would you know ultimately make her incompatible with other people i guess i don't know maybe i'm reading too much into it now but that's thought provoking no i mean i think that's absolutely the intention behind it behind the whole ending because yeah it's definitely um it's definitely meant to be ambiguous and it's definitely meant i mean there are sort of certain emotional beats or plot elements to this film that we don't even get any sort of closure to like i think it's a very interesting choice that the last time that we see her dad is after she beats the shit out of him and then he's never seen i think for the rest of the movie and then that's just it i mean he's that character has sort of outlived his usefulness and so he's never seen again and and that's sort of i don't know that's that's sort of the um deft way in which this film is yeah. made in which you yeah. know it, it it's the sports movie that's not interested in sports because exactly you know that's another compel compelling element to it is this is a boxing movie that has no interest in boxing and the, our lead character she at no point in the film has any sort of like genuine interest in boxing as a sport she is purely using it to gain respect to to get to garner herself respect i mean at no point is she like you know like oh i i need to study all these famous fighters and i need to like you know i need to know all of the ins and outs of the history of boxing she doesn't give a fuck about any of that you know, you know and it honestly now that i'm thinking about it it rem it's it's a less like toxic negative version of the character that's in nightcrawler played by jake gyllenhaal to, mm, to a degree sure. like as far as like the the drive and the willingness to yeah it's good but it's like i think it speaks to the cycle that she's probably stuck in you know though that like yeah as soon as the the dad gets dispatched they're like that that's the, that makes the, that relationship done and it, it's interesting that like the the relationship with the the guy is one that can you know at least he can try and come crawling back to her you know and you know and try to you know, re, you know, and keep it going whatever it is mm -hmm. no it's yeah. uh it, it was it, it it's sad that it took so much to make this movie happen you know but like mm -hmm. when you think about it, this was shot on film for like what a million dollars yeah million dollar budget yep that's insane it's like the true amateurism in, in that respect true independent mm -hmm. Even though she's obviously a working professional in the industry, you know, but you, I, 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 there's just something more genuine and respectable about this kind of independent movie versus the, the, the quotation marks that we have around things today. Because filmmakers are a lot more polished on their first features today, I, mm -hmm. in, in, I would say, compared to back then. So the fact that she can make something this good in spite of lack of access to material and you know a chance to experiment and try you know it's it's pretty amazing and it's worth watching just to appreciate that aspect of it yeah certainly and yeah and i'll, I'll touch on this you know uh again as we sort of close here um this film is like really really hard to find nowadays and i think God, and who owns know, that, it I, I have no idea but you know I'll echo what you're saying here in that, you know, this this is such a small film. This is such an amateur-ish film that whoever does own the rights clearly doesn't have any interest in, like, monetizing it. You know, putting it on a streaming service for, you know, or selling it off to a streaming service because it's, you can't find it anywhere. You can't rent it. You can't find it on a service. The DVDs of it, that I was looking at DVDs on Amazon and... It, you can only find used DVDs. It's not a movie that's an active mm. production. And they're like, you know, $30, $40 because people have realized that this is sort of a rare movie at this point. And so, yeah, the only way to watch this is a weird, sketchy Facebook link. That yeah. I will, I'll link in the description, as I said earlier, that is posted on some page called like michelle rodriguez brazil fans or yep, something like that yep, that's yeah. exactly where i watched it yeah <laughs> so yeah i mean it's it's kind of rarefied air at this point and um 
Yeah, and clearly the, the the rights holders have no interest in even like trying to copyright strike it because the movie has been on Facebook since 2017. That's so they pretty don't, crazy. They just, yeah, they don't care. <laughs> wow, because I, I, like, what is it? Amazon directed me to subscribe to Stars if I wanted to see it, but even then it said it wasn't available in my area. So yeah, okay. like whoever has the rights to it is like, we're only marketing this towards the Middle East and the far, you know, and the, you know, in the, in the Pacific Rim, that's it. And <laughs> for, for some reason, we, it's just too good for us. It's really too bad. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's the, the first entry in our little retrospective. She's made a, a variety of films. We, we toyed with doing Jennifer's Body, you know, or maybe even The Invitation. But we're going to follow up with her in a couple weeks when we talk about Destroyer the Nicole Kidman film that she made somewhat recently. But uh, on to the mentionables for this week. It's kind of kind of weird for both of us, but you <laughs> went shopping for some furniture. Yeah, it's. I, I thought when I saw this on the dock, I was like, okay, this is pretty interesting because we both are talking about sort of life events this week, but very, very different, <laughs> very, very opposing things. And so my mentionable this week is I finally accepted my sort of starting of becoming a middle-aged man and bought a lazy boy recliner nice and I wholeheartedly recommend this um I uh before this I don't know if you know what a love sack is but I do I had one I, uh, R- I, oh, did you? RIP I had one in the dorms oh nice yeah, yeah it was awesome I uh I don't know. I, I had one before this, and I f- just feel like I'm getting too old for it because every time I would sit in it, I would end up with some sort of back pain. And so, uh, yeah, I had to go out and get a finally get a recliner. And yes, it, it's treating me very well so far. Awesome. I'm very glad to hear that. You know, I found a Serta branded Lazy Boy on Marketplace mm-hmm. shortly after moving to Minot, and thank God I had that thing. It made nursing Luca to sleep a lot easier and and speaking of Luca this guy right here he's gonna get baptized along with his sister into the Catholic faith tomorrow I have my family coming up you know my sister and my brother-in-law are gonna be godparents everyone's very excited about it all that hectoring and badgering from my loved ones finally paid off and i don't know if you're if you ever like of course you've seen the godfather right oh yes yeah, yeah. all that's gonna go down sans the murder <laughs> but yeah the, the the do you renounce satan and all his works i do renounce him like all that's gonna happen the chrism oil is gonna come out november met with a father you know earlier this week and they hashed out what the plan was so that water wouldn't get in her eyes because she's very concerned about that <laughs> and then we're gonna have pulled pork and cake afterwards and that's gonna be my weekend so oh, yeah. yeah yeah sounds like a, a sunday in in the midwest absolutely um, yes what i'm just curious in so do you have to do this in in the catholic faith because i i was brought up Methodist and yeah. when we did baptisms it was always a part of the like regular Sunday church services and is that the way it is in uh, as a Catholic or do they do their own separate ceremony like in the Godfather? Typically it's its own separate ceremony Okay, um, interesting. If you're, It depends on when you're entering the church and what age you are. Like uh, when Angie does it she's going to do it during Easter it's going to be a part of the vigil experience you know like when because like they they make a big whole thing about taking the 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 wafers of bread and the wine away during you know easter you know like before jesus comes back after he's crucified on good friday and then on the vigil mass and then like the sunday morning easter that's when you get to have communion again and that's when they they baptize people you know and sometimes people have their babies baptized then but since we were you know, debating whether or not we were going to do it for so long. He's coming in as the six month old and yeah, it's something that, you know, we get to, you know, rehash again when they get confirmed, you know? Oh, <laughs> so yeah. it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a whole process, but mm-hmm. yeah, no, the, the usual, typically it's the Godfather style 
you know, okay. except like not with, you know, creepy organ playing over top. <laughs> I don't know what yeah. was up with that. But yeah, I didn't, I hadn't had a chance to read um, <laughs> The End of the Death Volume 3 yet. But I have to re- relate something funny about related to Warhammer because we've been talking about Jesus a lot and like the church with November and she's been asking questions and she saw this painting, this Warhammer painting on my desktop. That's my <laughs> background of Horus standing over Sanguinius's body and the emperor, you know, getting ready to, to fight him. And she points at Sanguinius and she's like, did he die? Is that Jesus? And then I had to like seriously try and explain Warhammer lore to this kid that is trying to process the Catholic faith in a real way. And it got very uh-huh. confusing for her. You know, she, you know, it, it was no fun. So like be That's warned awesome. about that. If you try and mix your, you know, your, your church dogma with your, you know, tabletop gaming dogma, but we'll see you next week with uh, a mini sode. What's who has is it me it's you it's yep, me yep. yeah and i'm gonna be diving into some thoughts leading into the finale episode of the latest season of true detective there's lots of discourse lots of biting back and forth between the different tribes of the fandom and the creators behind it and that's just been on my mind a lot lately so that's what i'll be digging into and then, of course, yes. after that will be Destroyer, and we'll telegraph everything else as we get closer to it. Thank you for watching, everybody, and thank you, Matt, once again. Yep. See ya.